Excellent. So let's go ahead. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cassandra Bull and uh, I am a policy specialist at the National Farm to School Network. I am your host today um, because today we have a really special presentation about food trails, uh, which is Rhode Island's pilot local food tracking software for schools. So I am honored to be joined by my fellow presenters, Jessica Petrolia of the Rhode Island Department of Education, Max Bernstein of KKNP, Shana Cohen of KKNP, and then Jesse Skeets and Neil Klissis of Food Trails. So our agenda, um, I'm gonna share a little bit about the National Farm to School Network. Uh, then we're gonna hear from Jessica and Shana about Food Trails project history. Then we're gonna get a live demonstration uh, with a little bit of Q and A uh, interspersed in that demo. And then we'll have time at the end for a Q and A portion. So if you don't know, uh, National Farm to School Network's mission is to increase access to local food and nutrition education to improve children's health, strengthen family farms, and cultivate vibrant communities. We have a vision for a nation in which farm to school programs are an essential component of a strong and just local and regional food system, ensuring the health of children, farms, the environment, the economy, and communities. So we're a network, we have over 20,000 members and around 400 partners. Um, and if you're not a partner, you can sign up and it's free. We're also guided by a call to action in which 100% of communities will hold power in a racially just food system. And that's guided with uh, six community values we like to integrate in all of our work. They are economic justice, environmental justice, health impact, racial equity, workers' rights, and animal welfare. Our core functions as a network is that we're a hub for information, networking, and advocacy. And we connect people to resources, to each other, and to policies that can help everyone achieve their goals. And that core function is why I'm really excited for today. One of the best parts of my job is spotlighting innovation. Uh, and so here we're learning about uh, local food tracking software. So I do a lot of policy and there's a lot of local food purchasing policies that have been coming about over the last decade. And with all of that great policy work on the other implementation side, we see a need for tracking uh, to support a lot of these policies. So that's why I'm really excited to pass over the mic to Jessica Petrolia, who's going to share a little bit about her experience and why they're working on this project. Thank you. Thanks, Cassandra. Hey, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jessica Petrolia. I am the coordinator of child nutrition programs at the Rhode Island Department of Education. So in my office, we administer the federally funded child nutrition programs, and that includes the school lunch, the school breakfast program, the child and adult care food program, and the summer food service program. And while it's not um, a specific program that we have to have compliance monitoring over, we do also support the farm to school program out of my office. And over the past five years, we've gone through a bit of <clears throat> kind of a reinvigoration of farm to school in the state. And as that we were coming together, forming our brand new, um, well, it was brand new at the time, Rhode Island Farm and Sea to School Network, we were trying to figure out what our goals were and what was the network going to do? Where did the state need to go with our farm to school work? And we realized that we really didn't know. There wasn't enough data. There was this big push to include more local product in school meals, but more of what was that reasonable? Were we at the max for particular products? How much local product was, was already going to school meals? We just didn't know. Um, and so it not only hindered the ability for us to establish goals for the network, but also policy goals. So if we were going to seek um, a local purchasing incentive, which I know many of you have in place, how do we even establish targets for that without baseline data? So out of my office, we naively um, started to do some research and thought we were going to be able to figure this out of what do other states do and how are they collecting this kind of information, particularly those with incentive programs already in place. We gathered a lot of tracking tools from other states. Everything we came across was paper-based or Excel-based. Um, and then we kind of adapted our own tool from that. The goal had been to pilot it with a few LEAs, see how they used it, and then what data was readily available, and ultimately put out an RFP for 
an online system that could help automate some of the process. Um, but we immediately realized, one, it was COVID. So getting the, the tracking back was really challenging. But we also immediately realized that people just didn't interact with it the way they that we thought they were going to. And it was so cumbersome um, that there was just no way to complete the tracking in a manual setting to capture all the data that we were hoping for. And so we had received some non-competitive technology innovation grant funding that's available only to state agencies that administer the child nutrition programs. And we decided to put a portion of that funding aside to support more formal research on what exists out there, not only from tracking systems that are already in place, but also electronic platforms that may not do this exact thing. They may not track school meals purchasing, but maybe do something similar that we could leverage. So the end goal was to, again, have specifications, either have identified a system that could be adapted to our needs or to identify the specifications that we would need to build a brand new system and engage a company to do that. Um, what the research showed was kind of not a surprise that it didn't exist. If it had existed, we would have found that, right? Other states would already be doing it. Um, but what we had at the end of the project was a really engaged group of now subject matter experts that included technology folks, it included food system folks, um, it included our own local partners in the state who had been really engaged in helping explain, you know, what are the barriers, what kind of data do we have? And so we were able to leverage additional of that non-competitive technology innovation grant funding uh, to actually go to what we're calling phase 1.5, which is development of the platform. And that's really what we're here to talk about today is to give you all a sneak peek. Um, many of you have probably heard me talk about this over the years. We think it's a really exciting project and um, it's finally coming to fruition. So being able to showcase what the system does, what we think it might do. We've had a lot of conversations about how it might be used in the future, not just to support farm to school efforts, but to support compliance monitoring in the school meals programs and just generally make everybody's lives easier while providing us a robust amount of data. So that's the nutshell. I always try to <laughs> ask Sheena, did I do it? Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Shana Cohen from KKMP, who is leading the charge on this project. Um, and she's going to give a little bit more detail on actually how we got here. Did thank I do you, it, Jessica. Shana? You did it. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job, as you always do. And thank you for framing it up for us all. And thank you all for being here today to learn more about food trails and this work that we're doing in Rhode Island with the Department of Education. We're really excited and honored to be back uh, as part of this webinar series. We joined this webinar series last summer when this work was but research uh, and a list of parameters uh, about what a technology tool should do and be. And we now have the bones of an actual technology tool that is doing and being, and we're excited to share it with you. Um, for those who uh, are not familiar with us, I'll start with a bit of an introduction here. I'm Shana Cohen. I'm managing partner of a national food systems consultancy called KKNP. I have my colleague Max Bernstein here with me. Um, we do research strategy and implementation for a really broad range of projects across sectors and across food supply chains that all have as a common element a goal of strengthening regional food systems and leveraging food and agriculture activity for positive economic impact uh, or, and or building community wealth. In this project, we have partnered with DigiCyber, which is Jesse Skeets and Neil Klissis, who you'll hear from shortly. Uh, and together, our teams comprise Food Trails, which is the product of this re research that we have done together. All right, so our goals for today are, are quite simple. We want to introduce you to the Food Trails platform, what it is and how we got here. We want to hear your questions and your impressions. And we want to take that feedback and it will, for us, be really useful to inform platform development. Um, we've done extensive research to get to where we are. We're working very closely with a set of users in Rhode Island. Um, but with every conversation we have, we learn more about how this platform should grow, uh, what it can be, uh, and how we can make what it is better. So thank you in advance. Um, as we go through, if you have questions, please do post them in the chat. Uh, we welcome them along the way. We may not call them out uh, and read them out and answer them immediately, but we will answer questions as we go. So please do feel free to post those uh, in the chat as we go. So Jessica gave great context for where this project came from. Um, but just to summarize, you know, local food procurement efforts 
were and are growing in Rhode Island, just as they are nationally. Rhode Island needed comprehensive data to understand the impact. What were school districts buying? Um, what kinds of products? How much? And what was known about those products? And as Jessica said, in efforts to track manual data entry and aggregation and analysis was incredibly time intensive uh, for food service operators and also really subject to human error. So this project really seeks to address those key, those, those three critical contexts. And our charge was, was to define the parameters of a platform that would eliminate that burden of manual data entry, make it easier, increase the accuracy of local food procurement tra uh, tracking overall, and then develop and launch and test and start to improve the simplest baseline version of a tool that could do all of these things. So what did we do when we were starting out? Uh, in the first phase of research that that we conducted, we had partners as well from the Center for Good Food Purchasing and from Farm to Institution New England. I see representatives from both organizations on this call today. Thank you for being here. And if you have things you wanna add or questions, uh, please just post those in the chat as well. Um, it was really a tremendous A team to do this research into what it would take uh, to build a platform for Rhode Island to solve for these problems. We did quite a lot of research. We interviewed district managers across the state. We talked to some of their key suppliers, including distributors and processors, uh, and also farmers. And we talked to technology firms that had relevant products to understand how relevant their products were to solving the specific focal point problems that Rhode Island was facing. We also spent a good amount of time mapping how food and information about the food flow through the supply chain. As many of you know, working in this space, uh, the way that food flows through the chain is not the same as the way that the information about the food flows through the chain. The information often stops before the food stops. Uh, and so what we were trying to figure out is how is that information collected? How is it communicated? And when it stops, why does it stop? And how could it be gathered back up? We also did a survey of Rhode Island stakeholders and food service managers. We got more than 30 responses there. Uh, and, re and 30 is a lot for Rhode Island. For those of you with a lot more districts and bigger set of stakeholders, that's a really large share uh, of um, a good representative share across the state. And we talked to other states uh, about how they're approaching uh, tracking, including what kind of technological their so solutions they're using or which ones they've backed away from and why. And in the end, after all of this research uh, and all of this planning, we landed on the parameters of what a platform should do. We found that the platform should be designed and improved iteratively in collaboration with users. In other words, it shouldn't simply be built and then put to use. Um, we should work closely with the users uh, to improve it once it's launched. That it should be really simple and straightforward to use and take into account a broad range of digital literacy and familiarity with technology. It should take in and analyze purchasing data from existing supply chain documentation and reports. It meaning it should, to the greatest extent possible, use a kind of reporting that folks across the supply chain are already using, already creating, already generating, and already familiar with. The tool should take in all procurement data, not just the procurement data that a food service director identifies as local, uh, and then the platform it sh itself should do the work of identifying foods as local, regional, national, other, or unknown. The platform needs to keep users' data private and secure. It should standardize and clean data on the back end. And it should allow for different definitions and changing definitions of local and regional. In other words, it should not count on the humans using the platform to know what the definition is or to know if it has changed. The platform should do that knowing. The platform should offer customizable and comprehensive purchasing reports, and it should publicly display aggregate purchasing data in a way that protects users' privacy, but provides an aggregate picture to the public of what is known about purchasing data. So Food Trails was designed with these target parameters as our North Star. We worked really hard in our first phase of research and in the development of this platform to boil down a really complex problem uh, and solution to their simplest forms and create a foundation that further complexity and further functionality can be built upon. The platform that we've built is based on the understanding that simply building a platform 
does not make information about food flow forth from the supply chain. I'm sorry, I wish that it did, but it doesn't. Uh, and so the platform that we have built um, looks at gathering information about food and gathering data and reporting and tracking on local food procurement as a way of working towards better access to data and improving data in the long run. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the demo. So it's very much a solution that's not focused on something perfect or an ideal state, but on the context and the data availability, the data consistency, and the expectations of who will respond and participate with the sharing of data um, of where we are now, uh, not of, of a perfect data sharing and management state. I see that there are a couple of questions in the chat. Anything, Jesse, that you wanted to raise up? Pause for one uh, second there. No, there's just uh, Cassandra stated that folks are able to ask questions, but now's a good time if anybody has a question. Feel free to pop those in the chat. So before Jesse does the demo. We do have one to... question now. Ah, uh, yes, uh, let's do it. Local focus versus organic. Um, well, this so this platform is meant to track the origin of food products, not the methodology by which they're grown. Um, that is something that product that that a platform could track in the future. For example, um, the Center for Good Food Purchasing has a, a, a set of values based procurement pillars that track against a number of values procurement. Um, guides. It could be about uh, animal welfare. It can be about uh, labor in the food supply chain. This platform right now looks only at food origin and measures against a definition that an administrator will set. It does not currently track um, things like organic certification or any other third-party certification uh, across the supply chain, but it could as you'll see, uh, if that information is available and if we build the platform back end to track that, it could do that. So where we are now, so you have a sense of this before we dive into the demo, we have four initial users who were um, very carefully selected from across the state. Uh, something to bear in mind here, Rhode Island uh, has is extensively partnered with food service management companies more than maybe some other states. Of all of the school districts in Rhode Island, there is just one self-operated district. Uh, and so we worked hard to choose our four initial users who are food service managers at the district level. Each of the users is a food service manager. And we chose our first four users to be representative of this spread. So we have uh, representatives from the three primary food service management companies that serve Rhode Island districts, Sodexo, Chartwells, and Aramark. And we do have the district manager from the one self-operated district um, in order to get that perspective uh, and, and her user experience. We are building uh, data pipelines for their key suppliers. Um, we'll talk a bit about what those data pipelines mean, but it's essentially the way that the platform knows how to read. Uh, the information that comes in to the platform. And we have these four users have just started uploading information into the platform as of September. What we're going to be showing you is not their real and actual data because that would not be respecting their privacy. Um, but we're going to show you how it works and give you sort of a tour of how um, how Food Trails was built and how uh, how it works. I will say the key thing that we learned in going through phase one was that when the Rhode Island Department of Education reached out to district managers and asked, how much are you spending on local? The way they got that information was that the district managers would write to their key suppliers and they would request velocity reports, um, which are simple spreadsheets that just detail uh, everything that would appear in an invoice, really, um, but aggregated over a certain amount of time. So over a one month or multi-month period, it would describe these are the products we bought, these are the volumes, this is how it was packed, this is the total spend. Uh, and where there was uh, supplier origin information, that was included as well. So we focused on that workflow, that way of accessing information, and that key um, way of, of sharing and moving data across the supply chain as the fundamental, um, the fundamental data input for food trails. With that, I will turn it over to Jesse to do the demo. Exit awesome. the screen share. Thank you.
Okay, hopefully you see my screen. Take silences, yes. You're good to go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, everybody, good afternoon. My name is Jesse. Um, really appreciate your time. Happy you're here. And I'm excited to give you a tour. So um, for those of you that saw this uh, a year ago, it was essentially a drawing on a napkin. And now it's a thing that exists in the real world and is being used by, by real people. Um, and so this is Food Trails. This is the homepage that you see when you log in. And um, this is the dashboard. And I will get into kind of what we're displaying here and how we got this information and how we categorize this information. Um, so first of all, it shows you the district that you are assigned to. You can be assigned multiple districts. Um, you can also filter down by individual facilities within that district if you desire. Um, and we have a breakdown of kind of the origin of the food by locality, unknown, not local, regional, or local, as well as displaying that information over time. Um, and uh, the most important question is, is how did we get this information? And what happens is, is we find that velocity reports, as Shana mentioned, are kind of the one common denominator across distributors. Um, and so here we have a sample velocity report. And so once a month, um, these velocity reports are requested from their distributors. They all look a little different, um, but they will have some information. Sometimes it might be just the products you purchased, but other times there'll be um, some origin information. And we take that origin information and we extract it. And much in the same way that you use Google Maps to figure out where you're going, um, we can take like the name of a farm or even just a county or a city, and we can get a distance between the receiving facility that purchased the food and the origin of the food. Um, so taking a look at this velocity report, giving you a little overview, you'll see we've got some dates of purchase, we've got receiving facilities, um, we've got the items, um, quantities, and then we have some supplier information. Um, and that that far, that information may be just a city, a state, could be an address, could just be a name. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we are going to take this information and we are gonna upload it into the system. So the system is now processing this velocity report. It's going to take a couple minutes. It's going to go line by line um, and uh, begin to extract that information. Um, in the meantime, I'll show you kind of some other things that are available within the platform while it's processing. Um, so the purchase history is available to um, to users as they as they make purchases. Uh, the system populates with more and more purchases over time. Um, and it gets that from those velocity reports that folks have uploaded. Um, and uh, so you can see uh, as these purchases get into the system, we get the value and we get the pounds. Um, we extract the producer information and the date of purchase. Um, and so this provides really great visibility into what exactly people are buying. Um, additionally, one thing we found that was a big problem is that you will often receive um, items in very various units. It could be, pounds could be represented as a hashtag, they could be represented as LB, they could be represented as pound. And that made the tracking of local food purchasing really diff difficult to get an idea of the quantity of food purchased. So one of the things that uh, Food Trails does is it aggregates all those purchases and it standardizes the units as it moves throughout the system. So uh, we ultimately convert everything to either pounds, fluid ounces, or case. Sometimes with cases, we just can't determine um, determine the like individual quantity. Um, so as we go through here, um, this loads. Um, we can begin to see the, the purchases that were uploaded in this velocity report, such as uh, apple, watermelon, banana, et cetera. They will begin to show up in the purchase history. Additionally, over time, as you um, upload products, you, we create a large repository of product information. 
Um, and this repository of products is visible to everybody who uses the Food Trails platform. And the idea here is to increase local food purchasing um, by creating more visibility into products as they become available. Um, it also introduces the idea of seasonality to people. Um, you know, it gives an indication of when other folks are buying apples, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and within food trails, uh, you can generate a report. And this is one of the more powerful features. So we can do a spend by locality. We can select our district and download that report. That'll show up here. And I've got a breakdown of it here right now. So now we get this really nice clean breakdown of everything we've purchased, um, the district it belonged to, the facility that it belonged to, and where it came from, and additionally breaking down these dollar values into local, regional, or not local. Um, within the platform as well, we have the ability to submit feedback. Um, we and this ties back into Shana's concept of we're, we're really building this platform with folks. We're not locking ourselves in a room with the information they've given us. Um, we're really building it alongside of our users. So right within the platform, if they if there's a feature they would like to see, they can submit it right here um, and we'll receive that and prioritize it and action it. Um, they have the ability to contact us. Um, and if they find something wrong with the application, they can submit a bug report. Um, I will go back to the dashboard here. Um, and oh, additionally, uh, as you upload documents, um, this becomes a, a central storage place of the documents that you have uploaded, which provides a really nice audit trail. So you can directly trace like, hey, here's the local purchase I made. Here's the velocity report it came from. And I can download this. Um, and as an administrator, this becomes available. Um, you, you have great visibility into the state as a whole. So you can see all the velocity reports that folks are uploading. Jesse, can you talk a bit about the standardizing of data on the back end? The, the, that was a question that came up in the chat about how the system cleans data in general. Yeah, so um, we use the USDA guidelines um, for unit conversions. Uh, you know, sometimes a bushel of apples gets converted to a different amount of pounds than, a, 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 than other types of bushels. So we use those guidelines. Um, and we also just standardize everything, as I'd mentioned, that um, if you have like hashtag pounds, it makes it makes it really hard and cumbersome and kind of painful as a human. We can take that and just force it all into one standard thing. Um, so you'll see everything as pounds, for example. One of the questions that came up in the chat is about whether the system removes purchases that are not uh, from the defined local region? And the answer is it does not. It preserves all of the purchasing information um, and continues to identify based on the definition provided by the administrator, which in this case is the R Rhode Island Department of Education, um, whether the food is local, regional, um, not local or regional, or not known. In the case of Rhode Island, uh, there. The definition of local is within the state. The definition of regional is from within the New England region. I saw a question in the chat also about uh, processed foods and about where ingredients come from. Uh, the definition of local for Rhode Island does not focus on the origin of ingredients for processed foods. It focuses on where those foods were made. Uh, so in the event that a state had a definition that was focused on, say, a percentage of ingredients in a processed product that came from a defined region, the tool could the tool could track that and measure and and support reporting on that if that data were available, um, which we know that it typically tends not to be. Uh, that level of product information tends not to be available primarily because ingredient sourcing tends not to be so consistent uh, that, that you can know where each ingredient comes from along the way. And, uh, and to that, sorry. Uh, Jesse, you go and then I have something to add. Yeah, to that point, uh, in regards of tracking non-local products um, and products of unknown origin, uh, I think that's really important because right now there's really no awareness of what percentage of purchases that are being made. You have no idea where the origin is. Um, and we're finding like, like currently we can process Cisco Glossy reports 
Um, it gets really difficult to determine locality because you're purchasing from these really large national manufacturers. We'll just say like Mission Tortilla. It's like, okay, well, Mission Tortilla has plants all over the country, so. I saw a question in the chat also about um, how we work with distributors to get them to list sourcing. And if schools work with vendors, farmers, or small distributors that can't provide velocity reports, what do they do? So far, we have we have gotten velocity reports from extremely small suppliers, those that make maybe one product uh, and put uh, and sell into the school. Um, a velocity report is really just a fancy word for a spreadsheet that summarizes the purchases. Um, so while that might be out of out of capacity for some suppliers, for most, if they're able to sell product into the schools, um, they're probably able to put together a simple spreadsheet that includes a base amount of information uh, about that product, such that it could at least be included in the spend and identified as local. Part of what we're trying to demonstrate here, you'll see there's, you know, there's this is demo data. Um, there's a, a large share here of unknown uh, origin there's going to be an even larger share of, 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 of food products within the total spend the, that are of, of foods for unknown origin. That's going to be the, the base state uh, that we're in for a while. Um, part, of, part of the goal here is to demonstrate um, what is local and what is regional, but also what is known about what is local and regional so that departments of education and districts have a lever um, to say we need more information. Uh, about food, to consider including language in their contracts um, that require the provision of that information, or if there are states that have incentive programs and require that as an audit trail to, to demand that information as well. Max, you had had something you wanted to add about processed foods. Did you want to chime in? Uh, sure. It, it wasn't actually about processed food, so it's about the way the data is, is cleaned and organized. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, retaining all of the data and organizing it is part of what is also going to, to allow the system to have evolving definitions of local, both as the data pipeline becomes more robust in terms of getting origin location from vendors, um, and also if there are policy changes, like in a given jurisdiction and defining what is local, what is regional should change, the system will be able to recategorize historical data based on a new and evolving definition. The other thing I wanted to add is that we are also uh, planning to track what is national as well, knowing that there's a major compliance component uh, coming up in terms of binational for school districts. In addition to that, the you know the recent announcement of USDA's huge investment uh, in continuing uh, the local food purchasing agreements and local food for schools programs that have been so so huge and robust over the last few years will create additional funding for local spend and additional need for tracking and reporting within local food procurement efforts. Um, so we're we're pretty excited to be building out this platform to meet the need for tracking uh, within the, the world of that funding pool as well. And another thing that I haven't brought up is we do um, categorize the purchases as they get uploaded into the system. So um, there's a lot of data stored that's not necessarily displayed to the user that could be leveraged to extract more information. Um, but but as products are uploaded, we categorize them into the USDA categories um, to help get an idea as well of, of the breakdown of percentage of purchases. One thing I want to say is we one of the things in our research that came up quite a bit was what about the ability to read invoices, right? You know, to the question about small producers, um, would they be better served by a platform that could read uh, invoices they provide rather than velocity reports? We built this platform to have food service managers be the key users and rather than having distributors be the direct users of the platform, even though they're the ones we have to go to or that the food service managers have to go to to get the data, with the idea that the distributors and the suppliers are going to be most responsive to their customers when their customers ask for data, just as the food service management companies and staff within self-operated districts are going to be most responsive to their customer in this case is the Rhode Island Department of Education, um, and that pressure will flow through the chain in that way for higher quality information uh, along, along the way. So when thinking about invoices, um, 
there were a couple of food service managers who said, wow, that would be like a dream come true. I could just take out my phone and take a picture of an invoice every time I receive a delivery and put that in the system and uh, it would just automatically go in and we wouldn't have to request velocity reports. Other district managers, more district managers said that would be a complete nightmare and would add a huge different workflow for me. I receive 200 different, uh, you know, I, I receive 200 different invoices a week. Um, I already upload them into my food service management company's system. And this would mean I would have to do that again separately uh, and upload them to this platform. There's a future where food trails can interact directly uh, with food service management companies' own systems, where food trails could interact with QuickBooks, uh, where food trails could interact with all different kinds of platforms directly to uh, streamline workflows even more and access data in different ways. This is a starting point, and Velocity Reports seem to be uh, the common denominator reporting tool that served the greatest number of suppliers, distributors, and districts. Um, there's another question that came through um, about how hefty the workload is for LEA staff and participating within managing this software, including retrieving Velocity Reports from vendors. Great question. Um, so far, the reaction we've gotten from our users is, that's it? That's all? That's it? <laughs> that's all I have to do? They they send emails to their key suppliers. They request the Velocity Report. They've shared the desired Velocity Report format, and they get something approximating that, um, sometimes with empty columns and cells, sometimes with more information. And then they upload it. And then the only other thing they have to do as users in this pilot iterative design moment that we're in is share feedback with us so that we can know what problems they're having, what they would like to see in the platform, what questions they want to ask of the data so that we can prepare the platform to be able to generate the kinds of reports that they want to see uh, and provide the kind of dashboard they want to see. Um, but it's once, once folks are onboarded and which is a pretty simple process in and of itself, um, the work is minimal. The work is very minimal. They don't have to rename a file. They don't have to even open the Excel file from the distributor that they receive. They don't combine Excel uh, sheets. They don't, they don't have to look through to see what was local and what wasn't. They don't even have to think about who are the suppliers that tend to provide the most local food for my district. Um, in fact, they're encouraged not to. Um, they can They simply get velocity reports from their key suppliers upload them into the system, and the platform does the reading on the back end. I saw another good question in here about uh, zip codes associated um, with, uh, I'm not seeing the question right now, but it was about, it was basically about a, a, if there's an address that's associated not with a key producer, but with, say, uh, a warehouse out of state or with a processor in a different location. And it might say like, oh, this is this product is local because it comes from this place, but it's actually the distributor's warehouse that's located in the locale, not the supplier of the food. Um, that is about, you know, we've we've worked with the food service management companies to under to communicate with their distributors what the data is that they want. Typically, that kind of information comes through when the distributors feel the responsibility to identify for their customers what is local and what is not. For example, there are distributors that have local programs and regional programs, and they don't take into account their customer's definition of local. They offer those based on their own working definition of local, which may or may not be the same as their customers. And then they would define the product as local if it was local to them. Um, but... It, we would not count on a distributor to define a product as local or not local. We would simply be able to take whatever information is provided, um, whether it's the zip code of the farm of origin, whether it's a name. Sometimes with processing, there is a state uh, that's listed and fill out the rest based on the process that Jesse was describing on the back end uh, that is similar to how we as people use Google Maps to navigate the world ourselves. We also have two questions that have just come in uh, related to pipeline development. One about working like directly with small producers and the other about consistency across uh, larger suppliers in terms of the data pipelines. Um, They're the last two in the chat. Yeah. Um, 
So for the first question for small distributors, um, I see the question, they write invoices by hand. Um, we, so we currently do not support like handwritten invoices. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It's just not where we are currently. Um, the one thing that we, we do have a um, like standardized VLOS report that we can share with folks and we have shared with folks um, to try to encourage them to input data into a format that works for us. Uh, but that does tie into the second question. Um, the, the column headers and formatting for velocity reports are different across every distributor. Um, and so we have to have a little bit of an onboarding process with each distributor that gets integrated into the platform where we build a pipeline specific to that distributor. Um, so for the smaller folks, we would encourage them to use kind of the standard velocity report so that we don't find ourselves building a thousand different pipelines um or finding some middle ground uh and for the larger folks we build unique data pipelines for them i i think one of the things i want to add because i'm seeing a, a couple questions come in about sourcing directly from small farms right that might that that we can know aren't going to be like they're not going to have it departments right in their operation right um, we're very much approaching this and the development of this tool from like a technical assistance perspective in terms of how we on the food trail side of things want to interact with suppliers. So, um, you know, this is where talking, Shana mentioned like a QuickBooks integration at some point, you know, chances are, if we know, if we know the farmer you're purchasing from where they're located, all we need to know is the quantities and pricing you're buying, right. And have an easy way of extracting that from whatever software they're using to do their accounting. Right. And, and we're going to continue to pursue opportunities like that as we build out the functionality of the tool beyond the minimum viable iteration. I see that there's a question about a qualifying list of local or regional products that's provided by the administrator and whether the system could use a database like that to match and then count as local, um, perhaps overwriting the existing location on the velocity report. We chose not to build this tool to be dependent upon a database that was provided by an administrator, primarily because the creation and maintenance of databases like that is so time intensive, so subject to human error, uh, and, and so difficult. It was actually one of the things that came up constantly in our research. What is the database going to be that, that this is based off of? Um, and I think that, you know, there in a in a scenario where you have a state or a set of districts that are purchasing based on a range of parameters that are more extensive than local, there could be essentially, though, this product list, you know, on on the website, on the food trail site is the aggregate set of products that gets into the school system. So these are products that are successfully sold into school districts. Whereas if you had a database, you might say, these are all the farms that um, are in our area and could potentially sell into, um, sell into the school districts, but it doesn't tell you who actually did it, uh, which is a different measure. Uh, here in this, in this version, we don't have um, in this products list, what is local, national, regional, or unknown. As we're building this out, that will be there in the next iteration of this page. So you can see, oh, these are bananas. They're not local, never will be. Um, okay, what about apples? Um, these are apples that came in via this distributor and these were not local. These were apples that came in via this farmer or this other distributor and they were local or they were regional um, based on the definition provided in Rhode Island. So I think that the the, the choice to have a platform that builds a database based on successful sales and purchases and transactions was one that we made uh, in order to not put this significant burden on the administrator, the Department of Education, or their nonprofit partners or whoever else they're working with to have and maintain a database that, distri that districts would then have to navigate without knowing who is actually successfully selling into the schools? Who is actually poised to sell into the schools? Who has products now? Which farms are still in business? Um, which farm? Which farms pack and distribute? How would I? How would I access them? Um, we chose this way of of tracking via actual transactions as a way to get at that information instead. 
in past conversations, folks have asked, how would I know when these purchases were made? Um, we've discussed the possibility of putting in a date that says like, oh, nobody, you know, no product purchases from the supplier have showed up in the last two years, right? If there's a date that says when the last purchase was made of a particular product by a particular um, producer, then you have a sense of, hmm, okay, if you are the district manager looking for a new product supplier, you can go in and see, oh, wow, this is a really, this this supplier gets product into the schools constantly. That's a potentially a good supplier for me to go to as well. Whereas uh, one that only has national product or only has product unknown may or may not be best fit for increasing your local procurement efforts. So in that way, this type of product database um, is meant to really help users increase their local procurement, not just track um, the local procurement that they're already doing. So I, I want to check first that um, Rick Sherman, your question about sharing um, aggregate data with other food service districts um, in the state. Uh, I'm curious if what Shana just mentioned about the products page answers that question. Um, and then Shana, we have a couple questions uh, about whether or not Food Trails is ready for districts to subscribe to, as well as the ownership uh, and business structure of Food Trails itself. Excellent. So in terms of the business structure, um, Food Trails is a separate entity from both KKNP and DigiCyber, and KKNP and DigiCyber are partners in the development, launch, and support uh, and growth of this platform. It's a public-private partnership uh, right now with the Rhode Island Department of Education and in the future with other, other districts, other states, other entities uh, that would want to use the platform. In terms of pricing and cost over time, we've been working on a pricing model for this product as it grows um, and have structured the model as a kind of an annual subscription rate. We're really trying to build out a pricing model that's predictable. Uh, it's something that we've heard quite extensively in the world of, of education and tracking and compliance tools that they, there are a lot of unexpected costs uh, that come from platforms when, when districts and states subscribe to those. Uh, and so we're seeking a subscription model that has a predictable, stable price for states or districts around the country. And we've based this on a per student rate uh, as kind of a rule of thumb or way of thinking about pricing rather than a per user or district rate, primarily because of the really wide range of ways that districts are structured around the country. You might have a district that has three schools in it and 200 kids, or you might have a district that has 1,500 schools and 800,000 kids. Uh, and it would not make sense to price by district in that way. So the way we're currently thinking about it is roughly a 20 to 35 cents per student cost for a year of using the platform. And that's inclusive of continued product development, the product being food trails, of course, and platform development, all application updates, security, data pipeline development and management, so increased ability on the back end of the platform to read from a wide range of velocity reports, data management, tech support for all the users, hosting and data costs. And then there could be additional costs that, that would come with higher level security needs or extensive data pipeline needs. And we're really, we'd really like to work with every perspective user of this platform to make sure that we can get to a price that makes sense given their particular context, state, structure of districts, et cetera. So we do strongly encourage anyone who might be on this call who's interested uh, to reach out. We're happy to talk through all of that separately. Jesse, anything you wanted to add there? Um, no, that sounds, that sounds great. And uh, I guess the one thing I do want to add is that we started the software development portion of this project in earnest in April. So um, that gives you an idea of what's been done over a little more than half a year. Um, and it's developed to Rhode Island's needs. And we recognize that everybody's needs are going to be a little different. Um, and we hope as more people get involved in the platform, the feature set will become wider. Um, we can add different things and, and um, introduce features that are desired by other folks. Um, 
So we also have one, what looks like last question coming in about whether the platform will be able to show characteristics around like other values, such as uh, BIPOC producers, women owned animal welfare, et cetera. That's a great question. And, and the answer is that it's very much in our, in our future field division that the platform could do that and probably should do that. And that many customers will want that and many other districts and states will be interested in that. So, um, there are a couple of different ways that a platform that this platform could do that. One would be through inclusion of information like that in the velocity reports. Another would be through using other databases on the back end, like the question about uh, whether you could use an approved database of local vendors, for example. Um, in that case, we voted against doing that for right now because there aren't existing well-maintained databases of of local producers. In contrast, um, there might be really strong databases of women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, um, businesses that have other third-party certifications that this platform could use on the back end to, to be able to track whether a supplier and a product meet those characteristics. So in, in that way, it would, it would really match in a lot of ways the same kind of process uh, and information flow that Food Trails does right now for origin tracking. But in sort of the next level of advancement. I see another question in the chat about the frequency of uh, food service staff reporting this inf information. Right now, we have our users reporting on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis, they're requesting velocity reports from their suppliers and uploading those. It would not have to happen on a monthly basis. We've done it that way primarily so that we can have more user engagement with the site during this time period that we're kind of piloting so that we can have a faster rate of improving the site as data flows in. Um, it really could be up to the administrator how frequently the food service managers would update their upload their data. Um, that could happen regularly or it could happen less regularly, depending on uh, what the administrator prefers. Cassandra, we never turned hosting and question asking back over to you. I don't know <laughs> if you have any additional questions for us or want to guide these in any way or see any others in the chat that we may have missed that you'd like to elevate, but wanted to give you that opportunity. Yeah, Max, you've been doing a great job as MC. <laughs> um, so thank sorry, you. For sorry doing... about that. No, I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate all of these questions. I want to make a commitment to responding to them if we haven't gotten to them in uh, in post, if that's okay with the presenters. So apologies if we can't get to all of these amazing questions. The one I wanted to elevate was from Cheyenne, I believe. And it was about whether the platform can handle different kinds of velocity reports and sort of problem solve for how that data would be entered. Was that addressed? We can we can talk about that. Uh, so the platform is built to read a broad range of formats of velocity reports. And we do have an ideal, what we call the ideal velocity report format. Um, which is the one that includes, you know, very clear columns. It includes all of the kinds of information that we want and whether those columns are filled out or not. Um, it is provided in that structure that makes it easy for the platform to read. The platform and the people behind it, us, do not expect everyone to comply with that ideal velocity report. In fact, we very much don't expect people to comply with that uh, ideal velocity report. It was in many ways um, an exercise in figuring out what is a baseline that we would like for this to look like when we send this out to distributors or ask the food service managers to send it out, what can they say uh, to their folks about here's what we'd like to see. Um, but when we build a data pipeline for Cisco, which we have, or for um, uh, for Gordon's Food Service, as we have, or for our local food hub in Rhode Island, Farm Fresh Rhode Island, or for regional distributor Rocks in Rhode Island, which we've built the data pipeline for. Those are all customized to read velocity reports in the format that those suppliers provide them in um, within a range. Uh, and over time, we'll you know be able to predict what are their ways of filling out 
those velocity reports? What are the kinds of things that the platform can expect to see? And so in this early time period now, as we've built the data pipeline and are starting to get more data in, we're figuring out what can it read and what can it not? Um, what are the, what are the um, kind of issues that come up as velocity reports um, get entered in? For example, we've seen velocity reports come in from some suppliers that have all the information possible in the product description field, right? So it includes the pack, the product as a category, it includes the supplier name, uh, sometimes the pack size, all within one field. So how do we teach the platform to extract the origin information from that one column of data um, where the data is there, but not in the format uh, that it was requested in? So the platform is able to do that, but we have to teach it to do that on a supplier by supplier basis. Thank you. and I. I think let's let's round it out. Um, Jessica, I just added you as a spotlight. I don't know if you have any final moving forward uh, words or sentiments you want to share, and then I'll pass it back to Shana to talk about next steps. And we'll end up with a call to join at National Farm to School Network as a partner if you're not already. So, Jessica. Sure. I think I'll just end with you know there are a lot of questions about what it could do and how good is the data. And I think those are questions that we have too and questions that we're working through together and are committed to working through with the users. And I think Shana mentioned this in the beginning, but there is um, a fair amount of data that's gonna be unknown at this point. And we know that, but we also see value in that. What we didn't wanna do on the state agency side was try to compel data that we had no way to manage or follow up on. And so asking people to report to us a certain level of local and having no way to collect it, to manage it, to follow up on it, um, or even writing it into our contracts and having it basically be a mandate with no compliance mechanism is not something we were, not a road that we were interested in going down. And so we've talked a lot about what is the kind of carrot to users to, de to do this. And that's that's on us. Like I see that as a state agency responsibility here is that now that we have a system, how do we compel the data? And that is through things like Rhode Island is pursuing healthy school meals for all legislation, like many state agencies are. And part of our draft legislation includes a requirement of reporting the amount of locals. So now we'll have a platform in which we can have people do that. We also manage a statewide food service um, company contract in Rhode Island. And so we've always had a focus on farm to school as part of the specifications of that contract. But now we can write it in a way where we say the responsive vendor must have X percentage of local items in their overall purchasing, and we can hold them to that. And there may be some data that's unknown, but then it's up to them to push on their distributors to make that data not unknown. So they're in compliance with the contracts and the specifications we've written. So I think it's easy to look at this and think, Gosh, there's so much that it doesn't do yet or can't have yet because the data is not there, but it's up to us now to compel it. And I think this is a first step in that process. So we're really excited about it. And I hope that you all are too. <laughs> thank you, sure. Jessica. Yes, I, I was going to thank you all, but um, in the last minute, Max, did you want to share? I was just to say, there's one more question for you, Jessica, about the possibility of using the next round of LFS funds um, to pay for use of the system. I'm not sure if you have any insight there? Um, the question is, or is it restricted uh, to food storage and distribution costs? So we don't have details yet on the next round of LFS funds. The first round did not allow for um, admin funding that would support something like this. But what we do have, at least at the state agency level for the child nutrition program administering agencies is non-competitive technology innovation grant funding. That's how we started this project. That was FY21 funding, but we've since got 23 and 24 funding. Um, and we also just got allocated what they're calling state administrative expense technology funding for the child nutrition programs. That's a first time pot of funding um, this federal fiscal year. So there's money out there to support technology. And it's just about creatively writing your proposal in a way that shows how this supports the goals of the program. And I'm happy to answer it offline any questions who, for anyone who wants to do that. Um, I'm happy to support that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, great last question. Thank you all. Thank you everyone who's here, who asked your questions. Um, we will send a lot in follow-up, including the contact information of the folks here. Um, thank you all presenters. And Neil, I'm sorry, I can't add you as a spotlight or I would, but we're limited. Um, yeah, this was really engaging and exciting. So we're really looking forward to next steps. Thank you so much for having us, Cassandra, and thank you all for your attention. Please do reach out if you'd like to continue the conversation. Maybe we'll do this again in a year. <laughs> thank you. Bye.
Thank you all. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.